Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about designing for well being, which is the second part of a two part session. Um, I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young, and we're your hosts today. And today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate any written comments and questions from the chat. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation that's provided by Stella Lauerman. Okay, so let's cover a few details about CORE. CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. It's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. CORE has evolved over the years based on input and insights we've gathered from many, many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups, um, including organizations like those represented on today's call. This collaborative process has led to the core mission and vision that you see here with equity at the center. Whoops, sorry. When we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being, and that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, their ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. So as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to align our different priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals and to work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. And equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that may be perpetuating the very inequities that we're determined to eliminate. And that's part of what our, uh, our session today is exploring, how we can assess those and, um, ch and change some of our actions. So events like today's session are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. You can think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of Core Investments offering an array of training and technical assistance and other learning opportunities for people across different sectors to build the knowledge, skills, and systems that we need to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. With that, I'll turn it over to Nicole Young. Great, thank you. So this is our plan for today. We're going to, this is basically a continuation of part one that we did last week. And so uh, we'll give a little uh, refresher about the well-being design principles from the full frame initiative. But today we're gonna focus on principles four, five, and six in particular. Uh, and as Nicole mentioned a moment ago, we'll, um, after we cover those design principles and have you think about them, I'll actually ask you to think about and reflect on uh, what kinds of patterns you notice as you're um, going through a set of questions that we're going to show you in a little while. Uh, what are some areas where you're finding or thinking like, oh, we're really strong or I'm really strong in some of these design principles and oh, this is raising other questions or issues for me to explore further or take a closer look at. Um, and so we'll do some of that individual reflection and then uh, ask people to share what came up for them and, and what you noticed uh, in our group discussion. So that's the point where we'll, uh, before we continue with the discussion, pause again to see if everyone's comfortable with keeping the recording on. And then we will close with our next steps and um, upcoming events. And so again, feel free to share your comments and your questions in the chat along the way. And 
Hopefully you all saw in the reminder email um, that I sent out, I think on Monday, that we're going to use Mentimeter today to ask a series of questions. Um, and we're going to use it so that we can see in real time uh, what everyone's responses are. That's kind of a cool feature to use uh, in meetings like this. So we first want to make sure everyone is able to access Mentimeter. We're going to do a practice run with a question. Um, where basically you can click on the link that Gisela just put in the chat to get to the um, survey. And if you click on it now, you'll just see a little screen that says, uh, basically wait until the first question appears. <laughs> uh, or if you're using two different devices and you have a phone and you can scan the QR code, um, you can do that as well. So it, uh, it might actually, um, some of you might find that if you have two screens, like a computer and a phone, or just two, two computer screens, it makes it easier to be able to answer the poll in real time, but then also see the results shifting and, and getting updated in the Zoom meeting. Okay, so has everyone clicked on the link or scans the QR code and has the survey? Are you seeing the please wait <laughs> screen? Okay, so here's the first question and I'm gonna activate it so you can start answering. Today, we wanna know what you think prevents well-being. In part one of the session, we asked everyone to, to share their thoughts about what well-being means to them. Today, we're asking what prevents well-being, whatever that means to you. And if you, I forgot to mention that if for some reason Mentimeter just isn't working for you, you're not able to get to it, or it's just too many, <laughs> too many screens to be looking at, you'll see that Gisela put the question in the chat as well. And so uh, if you're not able to respond in Mentimeter, uh, feel free to answer in the chat. It just won't appear on screen. What? What prevents well-being? Sometimes it takes a moment before responses start appearing, but give it a moment because we do want to make sure everyone can use Mentimeter. Is anybody having difficulty using, getting to, or typing in your answer for this first question here? Nicole, my my link wasn't activated. Like it wasn't it wasn't active for me to click on. So I just got into a search engine and typed in uh, menti.com and then typed in the uh, the code and then it worked fine. Okay, that's good to know. Did anybody else have that experience too? And so Stacy's also for saying, yeah, I submitted a reply, it's supposed to show up on screen, yes. Link worked fine, but I submitted a response and it's just hanging. Hmm. Okay, this is good that we're testing it. This is why we do these tests. Let me try. Oh, look at that. I think I just needed to update the slide or click on the screen again for all the responses to magically appear. Okay, so we see some responses here. What prevents well-being? Things like lack of time, uh, too much time spent on survival and not enough on thriving. Yeah, and not having equitable access to resources. Um, impacts of historic and systemic racism, socioeconomic factors, false sense of urgency that exists. Yes. So all of that is yes, yes to all of the above. Okay, so we'll be able to come back to Mentimeter in a moment. So it's good to know that it's working as long as uh, I'm <laughs> doing it correctly on my end. 
So we're going to move on and do a little bit of, a, again, a recap and a refresher around what these well-being principles are and what we even mean by this. So um, the content from both part one and today's part two of this copy chat is from, again, the Full Frame Initiative. And so they have several resources and actually a well-being design challenge where you can do some video lessons and some practice tasks on your own. Um, they'll even send you emails to kind of guide you through the challenge. But Nicole and I discovered this and really liked how Full Frame defines and really starts with this belief that we're all hired, hardwired for well-being, that it's an, an innate part of what we seek out. Um, and so Full Frame Initiative defines well-being as the set of needs and experiences that are universally required both in combination with each other and in a, in a in the right balance to be able to weather challenges and have health and hope. And that just felt like a really complete um, definition and description. And so we thought it'd be valuable to share, as well as the way that they talk about well-being in these five domains. So starting with social connectedness, meaning the number and diversity of relationships that allow us to give and receive information, as well as emotional support and, and material or concrete supports, um, that it's really important to have that sense of belonging and value because that's what fosters growth. So we loved how, you know, kind of for this first domain is social connectedness, as well as stability being another domain of well-being. So that sense of predictability and familiarity and that helps create these buffers that that can prevent the smaller problems or challenges from snowballing and becoming those bigger, seemingly insurmountable problems. Another domain of well-being uh, is safety, safety from people, from places and systems, and the safety to be our authentic selves, no matter where we are, without worrying about danger or shame. This Next domain around mastery really means uh, being able to have that sense that we have choices and that we can influence what happens to us, that it's not just things happening to us, but that uh, we can believe and, and have confidence that the effort we put into something influences the outcome um, versus feeling like, again, we're at the mercy of systems or other forces that we have um, no control over. And then the last domain is meaningful access to relevant resources. Um, I think this, the way that they define this is interesting. So it's the self-determination of what basic needs are relevant and important. So each individual gets to define for themselves, you know, what those basic needs are, what's relevant and important to them. Um, and then to be able to access those resources, again, without shame or danger or having to undergo significant hardship just to get those basic needs met. And we like how, because we, you know, everything that we do, we always talk about connecting the dots and how interconnected everything is. So we really like, again, how in Full Frame Initiatives um, concept here, all these domains of well-being are connected and centered around well-being. And hopefully this looks familiar or you can see the similarities with the core conditions for health and well-being which are essential to achieving the core vision of a county that's equitable, thriving, and resilient, and where we all share responsibility for the health and well-being of all people at every stage of life. So again, that concept, that notion of the interconnectedness with equitable health and well-being at the center. And yet we know that, you know, we're not there yet, that that vision is, um, not a reality yet. And for some, it's farther away uh, than for others. And so we're borrowing the words here from the Full Frame Initiative um, that a fair shot at well being doesn't exist today. And we don't see examples, and we see those examples of those inequities everywhere in our everyday life. And last time we showed a video that um, did a really nice job of explaining, and again, it was from the Full Frame Initiative really did a really good job of explaining how racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, xenophobia, and other forms of othering and oppression are baked into our systems by design and how that's created this fast track to well-being for some people and roadblocks for others. And it's those structural differences in access to well-being that reinforce things like poverty, trauma, chronic illness, and oppression. 
So if you're interested in that video, say go back and, and watch the recording from part one of this coffee chat because you'll see it there. Um, this time we're showing another video from the Full Frame Initiative about how our assumptions undermine well-being. Use, and this video uses narratives around poverty as an example. So I think Nicole is going to launch the video for us. Let's face it, our brains are lazy. There's just too much going on around us to process everything as if it's brand new. Assumptions are shortcuts that help us make sense of the world. Whether you're eight or 80, we all make assumptions all the time. They are a part of survival. Assumptions matter. But the tricky part is they come together to create mental models or narratives that explain things. The problem is just because it's an assumption or a mental model doesn't mean it's right. A common mental model in our country is that people living in poverty don't know how and can't be trusted to manage money. With every experience and encounter, we look for signs that affirm that assumption. But assumptions don't just affect individuals. People built systems and designed them to fit their understanding of the world around them. So if the people who built our anti-poverty systems thought that people in poverty can't manage money, those people designed programs to help, like focusing on budgeting classes and put a lot of restrictions and rules on what people can and can't do with cash benefits like food stamps. Assumptions are baked into how our systems function. A couple of examples of these larger societal assumptions are People coping with significant challenges are different, even deviant. Everyone has the same access to opportunity, but evidence actually points us to a different reality, a different set of assumptions. We're more alike than we're different. Our circumstances are varied and not accidental. There are structural forces that block or undermine progress for some people more than others. So why isn't it easy to operate under this set of assumptions? It's not about being a good or bad person. Even when we individually think and try to work in a different way, everything around us is pushing us back to normal, even if normal is wrong. So what can you do? Learn more and tell others. Check your assumptions. Be aware that a lot of the assumptions we've all been handed particularly about race and gender and poverty are just plain wrong. When your brain says different outcomes are because of race or gender or other identity factors, push yourself to see that different outcomes are because of racism, sexism, and other isms all around us. Push yourself, then push others. All of us are the solution. Together, we can be a country where everyone has a fair shot at well-being. Thanks, Nicole. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so these are the six principles for designing for well-being that full, come from the full frame initiative. So I'll just walk through them briefly. Again, we covered the first three of these in part one of this coffee chat, and then we're gonna focus on the, on the last three today. So um, principles one, two, and three are to start with what matters to people, their well-being, uh, and to design and implement with, not for people to heal and regenerate. So acknowledging that systems have created harm and we can't move forward without creating that space to heal. The next set of principles are to foster social connections and social capital. So really thinking about how to support people to help other people and to span boundaries across systems and sectors and the use of the phrase uncommon partners and really look for ways to not only span boundaries, but integrate, and then build on assets and innovation. 
So again, we're going to explore these last three principles in more depth today with an actual opportunity for you to self-assess uh, some areas in these principles as we go along. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole. Get us started. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to dive into um, the first of these um the second set of principles, four, five, and six, by using Mentimeter again, as Nicole said. And as you notice from the video, it asked us to push ourselves, and this is a way to push. So a couple of things about this. Um, we're gonna ask you questions for each of these, and this is um, a, a self-assessment. The questions you should try to answer on behalf of yourself, you as a human. So not necessarily a, a program or an agency, but do take the opportunity to think about your sphere of influence. So you, you are an individual answering these questions from your individual perspective, but what, what are the things that makes you think about in terms of what else you can push within your systems that you're part of? We encourage you to be as candid as you can and before selecting an answer to ask yourself, how true is that really of me? So for example, speaking for myself, I know that I might believe a lot of things in principle, um, but putting them into practice is a different story and I may fall short more often than I'd like. Your responses are anonymous. Some of you are diving right in, which is great, um, but we can't see who answered what. It's just for uh, um, self-assessment, as I said, not scored in any way, not a quiz. And we'll just um, use these as, as um, ways to provoke our own thoughts about um, how we can do better. And we will talk about that more in just a bit. So it looks like we have a lot of sometimes and one often on this one about the principle of how often do you support people, helping people before adding programs to help people, um, including removing obstacles to family or community members helping each other. So that's great. We have a lot of um, support for that principle in this group. Um, this can also mean that, as Nicole said, this is about the, the social connections that we all um, need in, to some degree. So an example might be um, if somebody needs housing, are we first seeing whether they might be able to stay with a family member and we can support that family member with some some funds for food or utilities or extra costs like that. Or instead of creating a brand new program that, that provides meals, are there informal community efforts that we could support between neighbors that are already um, a trusted um, source and could help uh, multiple people at once? So just some different ways to think about these things instead of always defaulting to, to programs. Okay, let's try the next one. So another related question is, how often do you recognize that no relationship, person, or social connection is perfect or perfectly healthy? So for example, this could mean being careful and intentional about not encouraging or pressuring people to end relationships that they don't want to end or not supporting policies that require this. Um, and you, you can have the compassion to understand that some relationships have value for people, even if they're considered unhealthy from another vantage point. So these are just people's lives are complicated. Somebody who's hurt you may be the parent of your children. And there are just lots of different ways to think about different roles. So can get complicated in a hurry. And this is just encouraging us to think about not setting a standard um, that drives people apart. So on this one, we've got a lot of oftens and a sometimes. Thank you for those answers. All right, let's try one more. This is still related to the fourth principle. And Nicole's not letting me advance. There we go. 
Um, so this question has to do with supporting bridging and linking capital. So if you think about um, financial capital, this is asking about the, the kind of capital that exists more socially. So how do we support these connections um, across differences of different kinds of identities, different experiences, different levels of power or perceived power, and not just with capital that's um, or connections that are among people who are the most alike. So it's getting to that idea of crossing. So for example, do we create physical or, or virtual spaces that are um, allowing relationship building, um, not just those of us traveling in the same circles or having very similar beliefs, but connecting across some differences? And do we design those spaces from the perspective of community members who may not have formal or positional power um, instead of inviting people into spaces that have been designed for someone who already knows how the system works? So being just being really conscious of um, when we're opening things up and when, how we are doing that. So here we have a mix of um, a couple oftens and a couple rarelys. Oh, there's another often um, and quite a few sometimes. So again, thanks for the, the candor. This is really about you yourself and just uh, trying to um, do some thinking about where, where you could do something differently. So we'll move on to the fifth principle and Nicole's gonna take that one on. Okay, so this fifth principle again is about spanning boundaries across systems and sectors and partners. And so this question is how often do you resist centering fields or areas of work and programs and even agencies and instead center people and intersectionality? And so this, again, kind of similar to what uh, one of the questions that Nicole asked earlier in, in, uh, in terms of, you know, instead of just immediately thinking about what does my program need, what does my agency need, uh, what kind of new program is created that you're first looking to, what other ways can we uh, solve these problems, you know, using existing networks of support of people uh, in the community? And is this one, just wanna make sure that this one is active here. So I am not seeing the, there we go here. I think it was on the screenshot version. <laughs> so again, how often do you resist centering fields and programs and agencies and instead center people and intersectionality? So we see, Couple often responses, some sometimes, some rarely. And this is one too where I find that, like my, I find for myself that I want to, I want my automatic response to be, oh, often, <laughs> I often center um, people, or I resist centering fields and programs, and instead center people. Uh, and yet, it's such a natural and kind of automatic thing, both for myself, and I feel like I notice it in a lot of meetings and discussions I'm in where we start thinking about like, what does my program need? How do I, um, how do I make sure that my agency, my program, that my needs are met for the agency? And we kind of couch it in terms of, you know, how do I get my agency's needs met so that we can serve the community? But it's still kind of a, uh, still puts the program or agency at the center um, and not always the people and the intersectionality of their needs and identities. So for me, this is a really powerful question. Okay, looks like the responses have um, have kind of stabilized. So let's move on to the next one here. How often do you leverage different aspects of the human experience, including arts and culture and joy? This is again about spanning boundaries. And so one way to think of that is um, that when we think about different services or programs or ways to meet communities, oftentimes we think about kind of the basic needs like food and shelter and housing, you know, those kind of concrete supports. 
And this is a really interesting way to think about how do we stretch and span those boundaries and think about other other ways that um, uh, humans experience life <laughs> and uh, other things that bring people that sense of well-being, that it's not always about um, kind of the traditional social services and the way that we think of them. So again, a uh, number of responses kind of spread out here in terms of some often, mostly uh, seeing responses here sometimes, and then one rarely. Okay, and then this last one for principle five, how often do you identify and advocate when policies of one system, including the system that you work in, and policies of one system create barriers in other systems? How often do you identify and advocate when you notice that policies in one system create barriers in another? Sometimes I hear people use the phrase unint unintended consequences. That's a way of thinking about okay, if we do this thing that seems like that addresses one need or solves one problem, are we thinking about how that might actually create different problems or different issues, different barriers? Um, and so, and and then if, especially if we notice that there's something um, that we can change, that we can advocate for, are we using our voices in that way? So again, I'm seeing mostly often responses here and then a couple sometimes and a couple rarely. Okay, I'm gonna pass it back to Nicole to walk through the next three. Okay, and now we're on the last of the six principles. And um, this one, this question is, how often do you start with what communities already have and diligently seek ways to avoid circumventing what works well as defined by the people who are impacted? So are we asking people affected by decisions what's, what's working well for them um, instead of making those kinds of assumptions or fixing things that aren't broken? Um, how often... Do we make it explicit that we're trying to build on what's working and not undermine it? So again, another hard question to ask yourself. Um, seeing some responses come in, a couple sometimes, people pondering, a couple oftens and a rarely. Okay, thanks. And this next one is on another rarely. Okay, so, so got a little pyramid going there. Thanks. Um, this next one is um, how often do you preserve innovations sparked by the pandemic, which most most recently, but also other calamities. So again, you know this whole idea that a, a crisis might be an opportunity. Um, so we. we we noticed um, during COVID, for example, there were suddenly a lot of restrictions for how to do things changed. People, organizations pivoted, systems opened up. Are we trying to um, keep those kinds of changes open and going and build on them? Or are we slipping back into ways that uh, doing business as usual? So. We've got a lot of oftens here and a couple sometimes and a rarely. So just trying to um, keep that kind of momentum going. Another rarely. And then Nicole, I think I need to it's not responding when I try to advance. There we go. Thank you. And so this next one is, um, how often do you reflect a new way of understanding a problem as opposed to an improved delivery of an old mindset? So this is, again, about openness to other ideas, new ideas, different ideas, instead of I'm going to do the same thing I've been doing, but just do it a little better. Um, so a couple oftens. Another often. Lots of oftens, a couple sometimes, and a rarely.
And this is not to say that any of these things are, are easy or straightforward. It's just, these are all just kind of self reminders of um, looking out for these, these kinds of things and, and trying to guard against our own tendencies to do what's familiar or safe or easy. So it's good to see that. All right, now we've worked through um, the three principles today, number four, five, and six. And some of you also helped um, or attended with the first part of this and helped think through the first three principles in, in a similar way. And so this is the part where we wanted to encourage some individual reflection and also sharing for those who are comfortable. And so I'll just ask again, if we um, record this part, which might be helpful to others who couldn't attend today and might kind of hear the examples and the thought process behind them, um, we will offer the opportunity to record it. But if anybody's at all uncomfortable, um, either now or after we um, finish our discussion or that if that affects your participation in this part of it, um, please let us know either with a private chat or um, to everybody in the chat, and we will be happy to, um, we, we will only do this if everybody's happy with, with or comfortable with recording. And if not, we won't record, no problem. So please, please share that. But meanwhile, please also take this moment to think about the um, actions or questions in the design principles. Did you notice any sort of pattern in your answers? Were you often, often? <laughs> Were you um, rarely often? Were you a mix across them? It, and what did that seem to depend on? What, what can you say about how you answered those and how it made you feel? Were you, did you have an instant reaction of, oh yes, this, or was it more complicated? Maybe you needed a minute to, to assess and think about it. And did, did the process of answering these questions spark any other new ideas for you, any approaches that you might want to explore, any reminders or affirmations of things that you want to do differently or encouragement for what you're already doing? We're just, we're really curious about um, what this might have led to. And we'll have just a, a couple minutes of silence to let you think through that on your own. Thanks, Heather. Okay, we're getting some comments in the chat. Uh, this might be a good time to go ahead and move to our discussion. If any of you are still working on your reflection, feel free to keep doing that. Um, but we'll show the kind of big question, overarching question that we want to talk about. And this is where we'll invite you to share your individual reflections if you'd like. Uh, and then we're going to stop screen sharing in a moment just so that uh, if any of you are willing to come on camera or to come off mute, that we can have more of a discussion. 
um, because we're really curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, what new solutions become possible when you focus change on where it belongs, on the systems versus the people that are caught up in them. And so again, if there are things that came up for you in terms of the patterns you noticed around your responses or new ideas that that came up because of that, uh, we'd love to hear that. So I'm going to stop my screen share and let's also just check again at this point is would everyone be okay if we continue recording? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so I'm seeing a couple responses first in the chat. I see Rhiannon saying the last question was one of my rarelies because I think it often feels like what we do works, but it is a matter of getting to people rather than change in the core of our activity. However, that that should mean questioning how we get to people. Yeah. Sometimes the questions like spark an answer, but it really just raises another question about like what else or who else or how else, um, which is really the power of that kind of design thinking that it's not necessarily that you have to arrive at the answer, you know, right away. But if, you know, it's actually a good sign if it raises other questions for you to explore with other people. Yeah, so it's a great insight there. See another um, comment in the, in the chat from Serge as someone who doesn't, who often doesn't have resources. I'm often working on individual strengths or available resources to help them help themselves. Yep. Yeah, so that idea of um, like constantly looking at like what are the available resources and how to really draw on and build on um, the strength, the existing strengths that people do have, right? Even even when people are experiencing really hard, difficult times, right? That we can always, uh, should always still, right? Start by looking at, okay, what are the existing strengths to, to build on, whether that's people or um, relationships or uh, just personal, personal qualities. What else do we have in the chat here? Anything else? What about, uh, would anyone like to come off mute and share any of your thoughts about the re individual reflection questions? What patterns do you notice as you were responding? What new ideas did it spark? Yeah, Rob. Yeah, I, I, um, I, it, it got me thinking that most of my, my responses were sometimes and and i wanted them to be kind of the always or you know all the time uh but thinking about it um probably i was probably more closer leaning the other direction in in reality so it just got me thinking you know we do things but do we do enough and could we do more and so so sometimes covers a lot of a lot of ground in, in these kinds of questions, but, you know, it got me thinking about not so much systems work, but more about individually, how are we impacting the systems? And, and so that was sort of my, my experience. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that insight and that, and being so candid about that. Cause, uh, well, let me just ask, did anybody else find that too, <laughs> that you answered sometimes and, you know, it's like, and sometimes the sometimes response prompts again other questions that are good to reflect on, like, well, when is it easier? When am I more likely to be able to answer often that I do this often? And is it with certain people in certain situations? You know, is it is it when I'm in meetings or projects with people that I'm already comfortable with that already think similar to me, or you know, versus the sometimes but really it might be more rarely because it's people that think differently, do things differently. Maybe we don't see the same things the same way, or it's just hard. Like there's just a, um, a lot more groundwork that has to be done to have a good start. Like, so there's lots of reasons why, right. It might be a sometimes response. Sometimes even just kind of keep asking the why, why, why types of questions can help uncover what is that, you know, individual, change or approach that um, could influence the bigger bigger efforts and bigger system. Yeah, so thanks for sharing that, Rob. Heather, I see your hand up. Yeah, I feel like 
Um, my answer was basically that, you know, I, I had a lot of oftens, but one rarely that stuck out for me was the joy question. And that's mainly because I, I just don't have the bandwidth to get the joy stuff done with all the other stuff that I'm doing. And so it really just kind of, um, it's just not high on, on how I would allocate my resources or my time or anything else even though it's it's desperately needed and wanted and it builds connection it just um doesn't doesn't end up <laughs> coming into the calculus most of the time and i feel like it really was it almost brings me back to the video when the the person is with the food stamps and and going and getting the steak and the first assumption is like oh getting steak with those food stamps and then the second you know part of that was Oh, getting it for a celebration. Like we all do that, you know, like, like humanizing what we all do all the time. But like, for some reason, I, the joy stuff, like, you know, I can't seem to to humanize it enough to the people that would be the funders to like make them fund the things that are the joy stuff that, that I want to do. So um, that was just kind of my interpretation of it. Yeah, really well said. And especially the part two about, you know, uh, like funding that oftentimes the joy, you know, is seen as like the extra stuff, <laughs> the fluff, it's not the real, right? And so it is, it does stretch our thinking about, okay, how do we make the case, right? How do we communicate and convey that it's just as important as, again, those more concrete uh, needs. Rhiannon, and I see your hand up. Okay, Heather, I trade and joy all day long. You'll probably hear some joy behind you in my round. And you're, you're, you're totally right. Like the funding for the joy stuff. This last year was actually a brutal fundraising for us for the flooding. We had several, probably, probably around $50,000 worth of donors pull out and say, you know what? People aren't having their needs met in this community. They don't have a place to live anymore. There's not enough food. There's no jobs. And so like, we don't have money for joy. Right. So that's a real and honest thing. And it's it's true, too. Um, I was just going to bring up a different a different topic when I got really wrapped up in Heather's um, comment, which is that so we at the museum clearly create opportunity for boundaries spanning by opening our doors and ensuring that anyone can come in, whether or not they have money to come in. Um, but it's really political, like most of the conflicts in the museum are about points where people coming from different perspectives um, around parenting most often are in conflict. Um, and they're often looking to the museum to take a stance on the right answer to those conflicts, right? Like they'll come ask my often young staff who aren't parents themselves to weigh in on what the appropriate way to parent a child is in a particular situation. Um, and that's really interesting to me. Uh, in the, you know, people were like, well, you should close down and make it really clear that this is the way things should be done in this space. And it's not something that we're willing to do often, um, unless there's sort of risk or danger involved for children. But um, yeah, it's it's always on my mind and want to do it more and make more opportunities for it. But it, it also is risky for, for us to continue to engage a broad audience, right? So as soon as we engage a broad audience, some people pull back and don't want to be as involved as they were otherwise. Yeah, that's a really interesting example, Rhiannon, of, um, you know, and I think probably the same could be said about several of those principles where they all seem like, oh, yeah, the ideal is this, right? And and that we should all aim for this and doing it often. And, and then the reality is that each one of the choices we make, right, can have some benefits or drawbacks or might speak to some people and not others. And so then it becomes, uh, you know, that, that, that is part of the important design process, right. To, to be weighing all of those. And so that whatever decision is made is done, you know, with partners, with community or, but it's, or taking into consideration lots of different perspectives. And, and that means that's hard, right. And there isn't usually there rarely is ever a clear cut, <laughs> always going to be this way type of answer. And so, yeah, just being willing to, to have those kinds of discussions, to have those kinds of explorations, uh, I think is, is really 
valuable, especially when you're an organization like yours that, that is such a visible public, right? Public space. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Any other reflections, things you noticed as you were answering those questions in Mentimeter or as you're hearing each other share some of your insights? Let me ask you this. What do you think would happen if you shared these questions and went through a similar exercise with others that you work with, either clients or projects that you work with, coworkers, other agency partners. I think it would be thought provoking. Uh, you know, uh, it's probably a really good way to start to address um, alignment uh when we're looking in our different partnerships like a starting point these are the kinds of questions that maybe you start at the beginning of a discussion when you're getting ready to take on a new initiative or address something that that needs to be addressed and so this is a probably an exercise that you would go through with your partners to to have them think about where they are and then do some discussion like this to to look for some sort of uh, common ground or or alignment on whatever the topic is or the initiative that you're you're pursuing. Yeah, I love that idea, Rob, using it at, at the beginning of a project or a design process or something where you're um you know, creating alignment and also uh like part of what I heard in that was you're also setting a a norm or creating a norm or an expectation that you can ask each other and kind of, you know, like gently challenge each other, like really how often, how often <laughs> and our, or like we said that this is the ideal that we hold in terms of, you know, that we design with and not for, or, you know, any of those other principles. And then when something comes up, right. That you have some language to, to refer back to, to, you know, as a, as a group, as a collective to think about, okay, how do we make sure are we really, uh, designing for well-being? Are we really um, thinking through like what the trade-offs might be if we do this versus this? And so it just creates some of that language then to be able to have those continuous conversations versus like the automatic, like, oh yeah, we asked, we asked one person, so we're good. <laughs> or we've always done it this way. So we're going to, you know, and, and it's worked fine so far. So we're going to keep doing it that way. Yeah. So like using it to open up really thought-provoking discussions, uh, I love that idea. Heather, I see your hand up again. I think there's kind of a framing and a scope aspect to it as well. Like in the last question, I I, I sat with it for a second because I was like, oh, I've been trying to preserve all this stuff that happened during COVID, <laughs> like keeping it there, you know, but, you know, as as an institution as a whole, are we doing that? Definitely not. So I had to like answer from my perspective and not from like an institutional expect perspective. So I think, you know, in just knowing how much interaction you have with, you know, how much boots on the ground, how much individual interaction you're having with um, everybody that's, that's having, you know, the, the, the needs that they're having is, is really like kind of where you're going to fall on the spectrum, I think, in some ways, you know, your higher, your higher admins are gonna probably say rarely a little bit more or you know, I don't know, that's maybe an assumption, but I just feel like there's definitely kind of a scope of where you lie on the spectrum based on how close you are to the work. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, if you are working in a team or on a project where others are willing to go through that self-assessment and if, if it feels like there's a, you know, a safe enough space to be candid and have the kinds of conversations where um you know where you're encouraging everyone be as candid and honest as you can with yourself there is you know like there is no right or wrong answer it really is where do we where do we fall as individuals so that if there are differences or things to um explore further or really examine more closely that at least then we know, right? Then we've got some information to help us look at, oh, 
we see things really differently in terms of how often we think we're doing this. <laughs> and, you know, and then that becomes your, your focus of, you know, project planning or pro program design or whatever it might be. Thanks for being here, Josie. Yeah, Serge. Hey, uh, thanks for doing the, the conversation. Um, I think uh, it's a different way of saying strengths-based and sort of taking strengths-based and making a little broader um, view. Um, a lot of my career has been behavioral programs. And I think like something I, you just have to learn somewhere along the way is you can never completely control people. Like people choose what they're going to do, whether that's whether behavior or whether that's um, you can't control the, uh, the world and you just have to work with the best that you can find, you know, whether finding resources or working with the person. Um, so I, I've really, um, and I enjoy it more. I mean, connecting with a person, I do a lot of like, as um, somebody was just saying, um, as I do face-to-face -face stuff, working with somebody's strengths and having and seeing what level of independence they can do to manage their problems with less lighter touch versus how much do I have to do. Um, so, no, I, I enjoyed the discussion today. Great. Thanks for that feedback, Serge. And do you find that in your, in your everyday work, do you find that others that you work with have a similar strengths-based approach and mindset, or does it often feel like I'm here in my lane and it's like constantly swimming upstream against the current of. <laughs> it's, it's harder and it takes more skills to manage things and not get prescriptive and telling people what to do and stuff. Um, I help uh, with some of the COVID shelters and stuff and a lot of staff, they wanted to just tell people what to do, even though it wasn't always respectfully given or fair. And they just were surprised and angered when people didn't respond well to that kind of response. Um, and now I'm signing up for Cal AIM, so ECM and CS case management, and definitely be training the staff on, you know, being to for the betterment of the person and working and trying to get that person to raise to their, you know, get them to their highest ability level. And, and well, joy is something added into this that is not something I always think about. But yes, getting them to their highest ability, potential for joy as well. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely be having it as part of my trainings for case managers. Yeah, you know, the, I think the thing that keeps coming up for me as I'm listening to all of you is um, how hard it can be to feel like either you're the only one or maybe just a, in a small group of some that are um, trying to, sh you know, shift norms and the status quo and kind of the usual way of doing work or doing business. And um, to me, one of the really valuable things of having sessions like this, like this core coffee chat, and next week, um, we'll have a similar core coffee chat featuring actually two of our participants here today, Rob and Heather, Heather Willoughby, um, on integrative design principles. And just like the more we can um, kind of build a shared set of language, like ways of talking about these things, you know, shared set of skills and kind of mindsets, then hopefully we're able to um, kind of, you know, build a more of a movement, right? Towards like, okay, what, what can we do differently? What can we, I heard some of you raising those kinds of questions. What can we do differently? What can we do more of or do less of? In some cases it's, what do we need to stop doing <laughs> in order to make room for, you know, a different way of being and, and working. Any other reflections, comments, thoughts? Anyone wants to share either out loud or in the chat? I know we've got a couple other folks on with us that um, haven't heard from yet. If there's anything you want to share in the chat or out loud, love to hear from you.
Okay. Well, I don't, I think, why don't we go ahead and do you want me to bring the slides back up, Nicole? And we've got a couple, you've got it great. Got a couple yeah. last things to cover. Yeah. So as Nicole mentioned, next week, we've got um, a, a special core coffee chat that will be featuring some work we've been doing as a learning cohort with Rob and Heather and some others. Um, so we're going to share with you what we've learned in the hopes of, um, similar to these questions, of trying to um, inspire people to pursue some of the same kinds of, of questions um, and design principles. Um, so if, if you're involved in any sort of project management, evaluation design, planning, um, or even just kind of wish listing, um, we think you'll find this really interesting. And it's it's uh, a, a webinar that we attended that was put on by Stanford. And then we decided to work together on trying to hold each other accountable for actually putting the principles into practice. So um, if you're um, interested in any of that, we hope that you'll join us just to see. Um, we've had a preview of some of the projects people came up with and the ideas, and it's it's been really fun to hear about and exciting. So that's December 14th. And then, um, amazingly, it will be 2024. Yikes. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, we've got several events coming up. Um, the Seeding the Future with Semillitas is, and the February 6th coffee chat on transformational approaches to creating economic equity both feature some of the things that we've been talking about today, about principles of well-being that um, try not to make assumptions about um, how people use money in particular and try to be um, innovative in thinking about how to best support people in the ways that work for them um, in a couple of different ways. So they're, both of those chats, I think, highlight a lot of the design principles we talked about last time and today. And then we were also continuing at the end of January, the, um, the workshops that we've been co-designing with DataShare. And this one is part of a series on a beginner's guide to data literacy, practicing with DataShare. So we, um, in those, if you haven't attended them before, we have a, a little bit of um, introduction to DataShare some, and try to showcase some different ways to use the tools that are on there. Because we know it can be really overwhelming and sometimes intimidating to dive right into those hundreds of indicators. And so it's, it's kind of like a guided tour of different parts of data share um, relevant to a lot of different aspects of the work we all do together. So we hope you'll join us for that. And we will keep adding to these lists. These are the things that we've got on the docket so far. If you have suggestions or ideas for us of topics, um, initiatives to showcase, we're eager to do um, some more about um, different ways to be advocates for this work, um, different ways to think about power building and power shifting and power sharing. So those are some ideas that we've been um, thinking about for future um, core coffee chats and also broader training and technical assistance. So keep those ideas coming. And um, we really take your feedback seriously and we, we use it to design these coffee chats and other training and technical assistance. So please take a moment to share your feedback about today's session. You can do so in English or Spanish. You can use the QR code or the links in the chat. And we really um, hope that you'll take a moment to do that. And let me just double check the chat to see if we have any other questions. We'll stay on for just a moment if anybody wants to ask anything offline. And that's it from me. Thanks to Gisela and Stella, as always, for the Spanish interpretation and translation. And thanks to all of you for joining us and asking these questions of yourselves and each other. And we hope they'll continue to be thought provoking as we all move along into a new year. Thanks everyone.